Well, good morning. It is a blessing for me to be back here with you today. Um, First Baptist Church Summerfield will always have a special place in my heart because it was two years ago that I preached my first sermon in Marion County and it was in this church. And I was just coming on board as the associational mission strategist with the Marion Baptist Association. And my job had not even started yet, but Brother Paul had asked me to come and preach here. And so I drove up from Orlando where we were living at that time and uh, preached my first sermon with the Marion Baptist Association right here in your church. So it's uh, uh, special for me to be back here today and I'm excited for you and uh, for uh, your uh, potential new pastor as you uh, get to meet him next week and his family and as you vote on him. I'll be praying for you as a church. I've been praying for you all along and uh, but I'll especially be praying for you uh, this week. I hope that I can stop by and see him, uh, maybe get to meet him on Saturday. And I definitely look forward to, uh, if he's the one that God brings to you, I look forward to, uh, to working with him as a, a pastor in our association. This morning, we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 28. And it's uh, fitting on this uh, Memorial Day weekend as we remember those who fought and served in our country, who died uh, protecting us. At, uh, we also remember our calling as followers of Jesus Christ and remember the purpose of the church on this, uh, this Sunday as you are preparing to call your next pastor. It's always good to go back and go back to the basics and, uh, and remember why we even exist as a church. I, I think it was Vince Lombardi that had uh, held up a football and said, gentlemen, this is a football when uh, his team wasn't doing that great. And sometimes it's just uh, important to go back and see this is what we're all about. So Matthew chapter 28, we're going to look at this very familiar passage of Scripture beginning in verse 16. And I'll be reading from the ESV version. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age." Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that we have the freedom to come and to openly and publicly worship you today in this nation and this place. God, we thank you for those who have fought for the freedoms that we enjoy, for those who died to protect this country, who've gone on before, for those who have served you and for, uh, that uh, we have just memorialized here this morning. Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we have. We thank you that we can open up your word, that we can hold it in our hands. We can read it for ourselves. We can hear it read. We can openly proclaim it in this place today. And Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world who do not yet have that freedom, who are gathering together in, in small and dark places, who cannot lift their voices very loud when they sing praises to you for fear that they'll be discovered, that a neighbor will turn them in to the government, that police will show up and knock their door down and drag them off to prison. Father, the persecution of the church is very real today, and we recognize that. And we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who don't enjoy the freedoms that we have, but yet who persist and they're gathering together, and they're opening the word, and they're proclaiming of the gospel and making disciples in various places around the world. Dear Father, thank you so much that we have this opportunity. As we look into your word, we ask that you make us doers of the word and not hearers only. We ask that you make us not only knowledgeable of the gospel, but obedient to the commands of Jesus as well. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we'll take a look here beginning in verse 16. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. After Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to his uh, disciples. He told them to meet him in Galilee. And the disciples went, and of course there's only 11 at this point because Judas had hanged himself. He was remorseful after he had betrayed Jesus and he hanged himself. And now there's only 11 disciples. And so they go to Galilee. 
And uh, in verse 17, it says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Even among the disciples, even among those that Jesus spent three and a half years with, even among those that saw him crucified and saw the resurrected Lord, some of them were still doubtful that God had done what he said he was going to do. And they, they doubted. And, um, but Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he gave them the command. But he, he started by saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Four years ago, I was leading a group of people in Orlando, Florida, to take the gospel message to every home in Orlando. We called it Saturate Orlando. And I know your church was involved in saturating uh, Summerfield with the gospel through the Jesus Film distribution. And I had been placed in a unique position to um, encourage the churches of the Greater Orlando Baptist Association to join with other churches of other denominations to take the gospel to every home in, uh, in the Orlando metropolitan area. One of our pastors, um, Pastor uh, Bruce from Killarney Baptist Church, uh, he and I were talking and I just said, Bruce, I don't know if I'm up to the task. Uh, who, who am I to lead such an effort? I don't know if I can do this. And he said, Mark, I'm going to tell you what I told the people in my church on Sunday, that according to Matthew 28, that Jesus has given us his authority. And then according to Acts chapter 2, he's given us his power. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, excuse me. Uh, so in, in the Great Commission, Jesus gives us his authority. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, remember it, he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So when we look at the daunting task that we have before us to make disciples of all nations, let's not do so uh, with doubt, as some of the uh, disciples were doubting. But let's do so in realizing that Jesus, in his authority, has given us this command. And he gives us his authority and his, and his power. So in verse 19, he gives us the command. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And the word, the word go is a continuous action. And it, and it just simply means that as you are going... As you are going out. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to leave where you are and go someplace else. Um, some people receive that call and they do do that. But it's a reminder to us that in our daily life, as we are going about, that we are to make disciples. Now the, the Greek word here for make disciples is actually an imperative. And it is panta ta ethne. Uh, it simply means to disciple all ethnic groups, disciple all nations, disciple all people groups. And, and so the, uh, as we see the Great Commission and we see the, 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 what appears to be the verb to go uh, is not the actual verb in this statement. The verb is to disciple. Uh, the imperative is to disciple. So as we are going, discipling people should be the normal part of what we do. As a church, I think you could come here and say, this is the purpose of our church is to make disciples. Tammy and I were a part of a church in Orlando that was established in 1954. In 1954, Southern Baptists had a campaign called A Million More in 54. And the idea was to enroll a million more people in Sunday school. And by doing so, uh, you would have the opportunity to share the gospel with them and their families. So in 1954, Southern Baptists had this massive campaign called A Million More in 54. And First Baptist Church of Union Park was established in 1954 because um, First Baptist Church of Conway was, was busting at the seams. The church was growing. They were fulfilling the commands of the Great Commission. They were uh, going out and enlisting people in Sunday school. They were sharing the gospel with people, and they had reached their capacity, so they decided to start another church, First Baptist Church of Union Park. So that church was started in 1954. But by the time we got to, um, to 2004, the church was beginning to experience some very serious decline. And the church was uh, um, 
was in such a state of decline that uh, Bert Gonzalez, who was the chairman of the deacon, stood up before the church one Sunday and showed a line graph. And the line graph was basically um, uh, showed when the church would run out of money. And it was going to be around 2014 that the church was going to uh, was going to run out of money. And so the uh, basically he was saying if the church is on the same trajectory that we're on today by 2014, uh, we will be out of money. And so the church was kind of shaken by uh, by this and they put together a study committee and they decided to um, to to study what the church should do as a result of that. But before that happened, I remember distinctively one Sunday, Pastor Coleman Pratt got the church together on a Sunday morning, and uh, we had set up tables in the gym. So everybody was sitting at round tables, and normally you would come in and sit down next to people that you knew very well. But what he had done was after you sat down, he said, okay, I want you to reach into the jar in the middle of the table and pull out a number. And the number was the number of the table that you had to go sit at. So what he did was he scattered the people and got them all uh, sitting together with people that they normally don't sit with. And then he gave each table a charge. At each table, I want you to discuss among you what is the purpose of the church? Why does the church exist? And there were, um, I think there was something like 18 different tables there. And there were about eight people at each table. And each table had some time to discuss among themselves. But each table was supposed to come up with one definitive answer. Why does the church exist? And out of those 18 different tables, do you know how many, eight, how many answers came from, from those 18 different tables? It was 18 different answers. There was no clear understanding as to why the church even existed. So when that study committee was put together, one of the things they had to do was to come up with a very a clear purpose statement for the church. They presented it to the church and the church voted on it and approved it. And they came back to the Great Commission and the, 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 the statement was simply this, we exist to make disciples. We exist to make disciples. And so the church agreed that their purpose was to make disciples. Now, I don't know if you have defined the purpose of, of your church, uh, but I would hope that you would agree that the purpose of your church and all churches, regardless of what your purpose statement says, it should refer to making disciples. The church exists to make disciples. So Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And we see that word nations and we tend to think of geopolitical boundaries. But as I mentioned earlier, the word in the Greek is actually ethne, from which we get our word ethnic. To make disciples of all peoples, of all ethnic groups. Because what Jesus had in mind was, is to come fulfillment in, uh, in Revelation chapter 7. The vision that Jesus gave to John when he appeared to John in Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, John says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our Lord, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So the vision is that when Jesus returns and raptures the church and takes his people to be with him, and when we all end up in heaven, that there will be a day when there will be people from every nation, from every ethnic group, from every tribe, from every language, standing before the throne and with uh, clothed in white, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, before Jesus gave this great commission in Matthew chapter 28, he had already said in Matthew chapter 24, um, in verse, Matthew 24, verse 14, he said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, to all ethnic groups, and then the end will come. The end will come after the gospel has been proclaimed throughout the whole world to every language group, to every ethnic group, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. 
When the gospel has been proclaimed to every language group, then Jesus will return. The end will come so that when we get to heaven, there will be surrounding the throne of God people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue proclaiming that uh, Jesus is Lord. So the command that we have to us now is to make disciples and to make disciples of all nations. Now, when we make disciples, it's important to note that God's plan is that disciples are to be made in local churches, in the body of Christ. And we see this lived out in the book of Acts. When the apostles left Jerusalem in fulfillment of Acts 1-8, when they finally left Jerusalem and went into different places and went on their missionary journeys and preached the gospel, and all we have to do is follow along the story of the apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. In every city that Paul went to, not only did he proclaim the gospel, but he also also established churches. He proclaimed the gospel and established churches because God's plan is that disciples are made in churches. We need the entire body of Christ to nurture these new believers. We need all of the spiritual gifts that God gives to his people to nurture these new believers and to grow them up in the faith. So God's plan is that the disciples are, are, are made in churches. So we are to go into all the nations, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the, and of the Holy Spirit. So not only are we to proclaim the good news, not only are we to disciple them and share with them information about Jesus, but we are to baptize them, which is their public profession of their faith in Jesus Christ. We are to make sure that they not only, if they, they, if they say they receive Christ, that they make that acceptance of Jesus Christ very public through public baptism. Now, this is very uh, easy for us to do here in our nation where we have the freedom that we have that uh, our forefathers had fought for and died for. Uh, it's very difficult in, diff in other parts of the world where it's either illegal to be a, a Christian or it's illegal to convert from one religion such as Islam to another, to Christianity. It's very difficult for those people in those countries to make that decision to follow through with their profession of faith in Christ, to follow through with baptism. But that's the command that we have, is that we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there. Look at what it says in verse 20. Teaching them, teaching them, to observe, now the ESV says observe, uh, most other translations says teaching them to obey. Teaching them to obey what? Teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. So the Great Commission is about proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world to all people groups. It's about baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's about congregationalizing them into local churches and then teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. And in that teaching to obey, it's not uh, teaching them simply to have the knowledge about who Jesus is, not just simply teaching them how to live the Christian life, but teaching them to obey the commands of Jesus. For the past several months, I've had the privilege of being a part of a uh, in-person class called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. Um, I, one of the things I enjoyed about that was um, Brother Ronnie Walker was in that class with me. And uh, many nights I was able to sit with him. We went through 15 weeks meeting on Monday nights from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. 15 weeks and then uh, a lot of homework in between, a lot of reading, about six or seven hours worth of reading each week. And then, uh, and then uh, assignments that we had to complete each week that had to be graded. So it was a lot like taking a seminary class on world missions. But there was about 35 of us at the Marian Baptist Association a resource center there in Ocala and we went through this class together on the final night the 15th night uh, Jamie Saint uh, from iTech y'all know about iTech 
Uh, ITEC, it's an amazing uh, mission organization based right here in Ocala. Um, it's actually um, located at the uh, Marion County Airport, not the Ocala Airport, but the Marion County Airport uh, out towards Donellan. And uh, ITEC was, uh, was, follow, was founded by Steve Saint, the son of Nate Saint. Nate Saint was one of those missionaries that was uh, killed uh, along with uh, Jim Elliott and others in, uh, in Ecuador. And a book has been written about it called The End of the Spear. A movie was made about it. Uh, but their headquarters was right here in Marion County. And uh, so uh, on the final night, we had Jamie Saint, who's the grandson of Nate Saint, was there sharing, teaching the final lesson of the Perspectives course. And Jamie was talking about this phenomenon that's been going on around the world called church planting movements. A church planting movement happens in one of these unreached people groups. When uh, someone goes into the people group, usually a missionary will go in and proclaim the gospel to uh, this people group that, that once before did not have the gospel. They proclaim the gospel, people believe in Jesus, they get saved, they get baptized, they form a church, they're taught to obey the commands of Jesus, and then that church uh, sends out missionaries and they go to another village and that church starts churches that starts churches that starts churches. So a church planting movement is the rapid multiplication of churches within a given people group or population segment. And by rapid, I mean they usually get to four generations of churches within two years. Four generations of churches in two years. So that means in two years time, a church has been started among a people group that, that prior to that did not have the gospel. That church uh, is obedient to the commands of Christ and people are getting saved and they're being baptized and then there's so many people coming to know Christ that that church has to start another church. So they, they develop a new leader, they send out a new leader and they start another church and then that church starts a church and that church starts a church and that church starts a church. The same thing was happening in the New Testament in the book of Acts. The, the church at Jerusalem started a church in Antioch Antioch. And Antioch sent out um, Paul and Barnabas and later Paul and Silas, and they went on missionary journeys. And they went to, Paul and, and uh, Silas and Timothy went to Ephesus and started a church in Ephesus. And we read about it in Acts chapter 19. And we can also read about it in the letter to the church at Ephesus. And we can read about it in First and Second Timothy. And we can read about it in First and Second and Third John. Uh, because Timothy was the pastor at the church at Ephesus, and then later John was the pastor at the church at Ephesus. And we also read about it in the book of Revelation chapter 2. It's the first letter that Jesus told John to send to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So the church at Ephesus also started a church in Colossae, about 30 or 40 miles away, and then the church at Colossae started a church in Hierapolis and Laodicea. So you see, we have the rapid multiplication of churches planting churches as the gospel is spreading, as people are obeying the commands of Christ, as they're taking the gospel into new territory among new people groups, and to new language groups, new ethnic groups, uh, new uh, countries, as the gospel is being spread people are obeying the commands of Christ, they're getting baptized, they're being uh, congregationalized into churches, and then those churches are growing exponentially, and they're multiplying. One of the things that, um, that Jamie Saint said on that final night of the Perspectives course is this is happening all over the world, but not so much here in the United States. In the United States, Christianity is not spreading rapidly. Instead, it is in a state of decline. And uh, we can only go to Europe and see what has happened to the great churches in Europe and see what decline looks like. And some of the great churches in Europe are now museum pieces. There are no worship services being held there, or if they're held there, a group of uh, four or five people are huddling together. But mostly people are going there to look at the great architecture and look at the great past of what's happened in those churches. America is headed in the same direction. A Christianity in the United States is in a state of decline. And Jamie was asked, why do you think that is? And he said, I think the reason why the gospel is spreading so rapidly in some places and it's in decline in others is this. He said, it's this one thing. It's obedience. In America, we tend to teach a knowledge-based discipleship. 
When we lead somebody to Christ and we bring them into a Sunday school class or discipleship training, for us, discipleship is making sure that they understand who Jesus is, they understand how to read and study the scriptures, and they, they know what Jesus taught. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, but what he said, what is, what is happening in these places where the gospel is spreading rapidly and it's multiplying quickly is they practice obedience-based discipleship. It's not just hearing the word of the Lord, but it's doing it as well. And it, it's a great indictment on what's been happening in our country, and it's a great indictment on who we are as churches. And I think it's important that we go back to the, the foundation of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. The purpose of the church is to make disciples, and we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And churches that have uh, leaders need to, uh, need to multiply their leaders. Leaders should be developing new leaders. And then Sunday school classes should be starting new Sunday school classes. Small groups should be starting small groups. And churches should be planning churches. And that is the plan that Jesus gave his disciples. And that is the plan that, that we see throughout the New Testament is a plan of multiplication. Uh, disciples making disciples, leaders developing leaders, churches planting churches. In um, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and I think it's interesting that it's 2.2.2, it's the 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus, he said, the things that you have heard from me teach also to reliable men who will be faithful to teach others. And when you look at that, that's four generations of leadership multiplication. Paul poured into Timothy. Paul was the mentor. Timothy was the protege. But he also told Timothy that he was to be mentoring other people as well, who will in turn mentor other people. So there's four generations of leadership multiplication there. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, it gives the job description, the job descriptions of pastors and church leaders. So since you're getting ready to call a new pastor, it's probably a good idea to see what the Bible says his job description is. And his job description isn't to come and do all of the ministry for you. It isn't to come and do all the preaching for you and all of the teaching for you so that you can all sit and watch him do it. It says in Ephesians 4.12 that the role of the pastor and of church leaders is to equip God's people to do the works of service. It's to equip God's people to do the works of service. So even pastors are to be multiplying their leadership by equipping God's people to do the work of service. And what Jamie Saint said on that, um, that final night of the Perspectives course has just rattled me to the core. He said, in America, we practice a knowledge-based discipleship instead of an obedience-based discipleship. So in order to remedy that, I've gone to um, some resources that I already had available to me. I uh, went back to some knowledge that I already had that God had provided for me from some great leaders and put that together. And we're developing an online course. Um, in fact, the timing is just right. Uh, next Wednesday, or this, this Wednesday coming up, we're going to have our first online class called Disciples Making Disciples. Uh, Wednesday afternoons at 3 o'clock. It's, it's a live video. You can come in and watch. It's free to anybody. And it's called Disciples Making Disciples. How do you get there? You go to our website, reach.mba. R-E-A-C-H dot M-B-A. M-B-A stands for Marian Baptist Association. So instead of dot com, dot org, dot net, you type in reach dot M-B-A. You'll get to our website. Right across the top, there's a banner, and it says, join us live uh, Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Now, if you can't be there Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, that's okay, because I'm recording all of those sessions, and they'll be online that anybody can watch anytime from anywhere in the world 24-7. The material that we were using, that we will be using, was developed by a pastor in West Palm Beach, Florida, named Dr. David Nelms. And he called it the Timothy Initiative, based on 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He pastored uh, Grace Fellowship Church in West Palm Beach, and a few years ago, they started taking mission trips to India. And they first started going to India on short-term mission trips to do what you do on short-term mission trips. You go and proclaim the gospel. But what they realized they were doing was that when they left and would come back to the States, they were leaving behind brand new baby Christians. The Great Commission, Jesus didn't tell us to go preach the gospel, did he? He said, go make disciples. 
Now, you can't make disciples if you don't proclaim the gospel. But it's, we can't just go and proclaim the gospel and then come back home. It said, go make disciples. And so what Dr. Nelms began to realize was that they needed to go back to India and organize these new Christians into churches. And they needed to do what Paul did and appoint at least one of them to be an elder, but preferably more. So you have a plurality of elders. So they started going back to India and, and gathering these groups of believers together and they started planting churches. And then what they started doing, what well, they realized, they, they, you know, to lead these churches, the person leading this church was a new Christian himself. And so he needed some basic Bible knowledge and some, uh, some basic uh, teaching. So they developed an entire um, uh, curriculum of, of 12 books. The first two books are Disciples Making Disciples, Level 1 and Level 2. And then there's 10 other books to take a new Christian through the process that they would be needed in order to have all the knowledge they needed in order to pastor a church. But then what they told them to do was not to keep all this knowledge for yourself. They require that everybody that they're training would then train somebody else who would then train somebody else, who would then train somebody else, following the 2 Timothy 2.2.2 process. The things you have heard from me and trust to reliable men who will be faithful to teach others. They started following that process, and after 10 years had gone by, and by the way, they, they used that process in India, they went into Pakistan, then they went into other countries in the Middle East, and then into North Africa, and through that process, in a 10-year period of time, they saw over 50,000 churches started. 50,000 churches, because every church that they started was expected to disciple more people, develop new leaders, and start new churches. And they saw 50,000 churches started in areas of the world where Christians are under intense persecution, where they don't have the freedoms that we have here. And they're not meeting in public buildings like we have. And they're not using the internet the way we are. And they're not putting out signs on the highway and say, come go to church on Sunday. They can't do any of those things. They're spreading the gospel by word of mouth. And each believer is expected to share the gospel with their family and friends and relatives and co-workers and neighbors. And so uh, believers are sharing the gospel with other believers. Each person who's being discipled is expected to take everything that they learn and share that with somebody else. Every leader in the church is expected to apprentice new leaders so that uh, every leadership position is filled and they actually have an ex excess of leaders. Instead of having all the leaders they need, they have twice as many leaders as they need, so they have enough to send them out to start new churches. And that's the process that God is using around the world today. It's the process that he used in the New Testament. It's part of that command to obey the commands of Jesus and to do everything that he taught us to do. It sounds difficult, doesn't it? It sounds overwhelming, but remember, Jesus gave his authority to his disciples to do this kind of work. And then in uh, and Acts 1.8, he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. And then look what he says here in the latter part of, of verse 20. He said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He is with us. He didn't just give us this command and leave us. He gave us his Holy Spirit, as he said in, in John chapter 17. He said, I must go, I must depart, so that another comforter can come, another of the same kind, and that is the Holy Spirit. So in computer terminology, he gave us the source code. If you know what that means, you know, if, if you have um, uh, comp developed computer software, and you want to sell that computer software and, and make a lot of money on it, then you lock it down so that nobody else can see the source code. But if you don't care about making a lot of money on it and you want other people to take that software and improve on it and you want it to, to, to be able to spread all over the world that, so that anybody can use it, then you make it open source and you give away the source code. And that's the kind of leader that Jesus is. He gave us access to all of the knowledge and all of the authority and all of the power that he has. And he says, I will be with you always, even till the end of the age. So we have no excuse and no reason not to be obedient followers of Jesus. We have no reason not to obey the commands of Jesus and to follow obedience-based discipleship. I mentioned the church of Ephesus quite a bit, and um, 
uh, one of the exciting things that happened with the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, verse 10, after that church was started, it says in Acts 19, verse 10, this went on for two years so that all of the inhabitants of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All of the inhabitants of Asia. Now, we're not talking about the continent of Asia. We're talking about the Roman province that we would refer to as Asia Minor. It was basically Western Turkey. But that's where Ephesus was located. Everybody in the city of Ephesus heard the gospel. And everybody in the region surrounding that, that church heard the gospel. And that they heard that go the gospel through the uh, proclaiming of the gospels, the making of disciples, and the planting of churches. And the result of that was that within two years' time, everybody heard the gospel. Uh, what an amazing thing. So I've been praying about that and asking, God, do you want that for Marion County? Do you want that for North Central Florida? That every person would hear the gospel. Every person would have the opportunity to become a disciple of Jesus. Every person who believes would be baptized. Every person who's baptized is discipled. Every person who's discipled is a part of a church. Every person who's a, who is discipled makes disciples. Every person who's a leader in a church develops new leaders. And every church that exists also sends those leaders out to start new churches. And that's what obedience-based discipleship is. And that's the, the gist of the Great Commission. And uh, if you're doubting, you know, you're in good company because some of the apostles doubted when Jesus stood before them. The resurrected Jesus was standing before them. We know that Thomas doubted. And he wanted to stick his finger into the hands, into the holes in Jesus' hands. So some of them doubted. Uh, and doubt is, is a human reaction to a supernatural uh, truth. The supernatural truth is, is that we are to take the gospel to every people group, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. The supernatural truth is that every believer should be sharing their faith. Every disciple should be making new disciples. Every leader should be developing new leaders. And every church should be starting new churches. That's the supernatural truth. But let's pray to God to ask him to help us overcome our doubt. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your son Jesus who came to die on the cross to pay the price for our sin. We're so thankful that he considered us worthy to be a part of your plan to redeem all of mankind, that you have entrusted the gospel to people like us. It's like a treasure inside jars of clay that's got to get out. And Father, we realize that we have a daunting task before us, and as human beings, we have doubts. But we ask that you help us to overcome our doubts, that we understand that this command has been given to us by your son Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and earth, and that the power of your Holy Spirit has come upon us and it will make us witnesses so that we can proclaim the gospel in Summerfield and in Marion County and all of Florida and out to the uttermost parts of the world. We ask that you come upon us and give us that amazing ability to do so. I ask that you bless Summerfield First Baptist Church and their new uh, pastor candidate as he comes next week. I ask that you make this decision that they have before them to be super clear, um, um, super clear one way or the other. Either this man is the pastor for their church or not. And Father, I ask that you bless them and give them an amazing future as a church. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This is our time of invitation. If God has called you to receive Jesus as his Savior, as your Savior and Lord, to receive his salvation, you can come. And uh, I'll be down here. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you've made a, a decision in your life to serve God in a different way, or maybe God's called you to come and join this church in fellowship in this church, you can respond now during this time of invitation as we sing.